pleasure to see the room so full. Amen. We got dental representation this year. I'm going to have a quick word of prayer, and then I'm going to introduce our first presenter, if you would bow your heads with me. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together to share. Uh, thank you for all these providers in oral care, and we just uh, ask that you would inspire us through these testimonies and through these presentations this afternoon. These things I pray in your son's name. Amen. I have known Dr. Gerardo Toledo for, man, true story. My wife brought, was brought to church to meet this good doctor. They already knew each other, but the girl who brought her to meet him was hoping that they would end up married, and I met her that day. So anyway, that happened. That went down. That was weird. Okay. Uh, <laughs> We're good friends. We live down the street from each other. Anyway, um, Dr. Gerardo Toledo is an endodontist. He is an active missionary. He has um, a uh, ministry called uh, Bangla Help, where um, his office um, is actually kind of the purveyor of support for seven elementary schools. Is it seven? Five elementary schools in Bangladesh. Um, so I actually had the opportunity to go uh, two years ago before the pandemic with Dr. Adrian Charles Marcel, our second presenter, um, or second presenter, third, second, um, and we were able to minister to all those children over there. We did, you know, took care of them, gave them, you know, dental treatment, uh, made a big old piñata, and had a great time. Um, so his office is actually the one that actually uh, provides the structure, the support, They've also been uh, active in, um, how do you say, extracting uh, in human trafficking, uh, prostitution over there. I mean, there's a lot of covert stuff going on that, that he actually supports. Uh, and his office is kind of the fountain on this side that, uh, that supports. Um, so he does a lot of work on this side. I asked him to come and, and be a presenter this year uh, so that he can sh possibly show us how our uh, dental offices here on stateside or where we have a little more resources could help and support uh, some of the ministries abroad. Uh, our dollar goes quite a long way if you get it connected in the right spot. You might even be inspired to support Gerardo in this incredible work that he's doing. So Dr. Toledo, the time is yours. <coughs> okay. Thank you. I, I, I can't go. Okay. Well, it's nice to be here. I think it's a privilege. I'm very happy uh, to meet all of you. I come uh, usually to the meeting here uh, in the West Coast. And uh, it's always for me a pleasure to talk about Bangladesh. I will, sh that will, be, I will show you what part of the ministry is. And um, one of the beautiful things of Bangladesh, this is the a sunset. And it's one of the most beautiful sunsets when you go in the villages, when you see the, the rice fields. Uh, it's a very interesting country to visit. Uh, a poor country, but uh, many pictures to be taken there. So let me pray before we get started. Let's, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this meeting, uh, all the things that we are listening, all the testimonies. I ask you, Lord, that uh, you will inspire us uh, after this weekend to surrender our lives to you and help us to be your vessels in reaching others. In Jesus' name, amen. So Carlos uh, called me one day and said, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you, to share at Amen how your office is helping in Bangladesh. So I thought, boy, that I can say that in two or three minutes. I send money, <laughs> basically. But that, uh, he's, he gave me one hour. <laughs> so I'll t tell you a little bit more. So the first thing is uh, it's a disclaimer. And it's, uh, it is very uncomfortable, really, to share what you do or what you give. Uh, you know, the, I, many, many verses of the Bible come to my mind. You know, let know your left hand know what your right hand do, uh, does, and, and so forth. Um, so to be fair to you, I will tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you will hear the whole thing, okay? And uh, in, in, in some of the things I share, I want to share the, the, the faithfulness of God in, in, uh, when we commit to, we follow what he says. So how I ended up in Bangladesh, a long time ago, my mom, when I was uh, probably eight years old, she gave me the book of uh, Luz en la Selva, Light in the Jungle. Is the story of Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who worked as a missionary in Gabon. 
many, many years ago. And at that age, after I read that book, I think I finished it in a, in a siesta time, during nap time, uh, I decided to be a missionary. So I always grew up knowing I will be a missionary. I always wanted to go to Africa because that's where he went. Actually, my older brother, he ended up in Madagascar, and I ended up in Bangladesh. So in 1993, I received a call to go to Bangladesh. And I remember I had, we had those phones that uh, you will have to dial. And uh, Dr. Karman called me and said, we'd like to go to Bangladesh. So my English was w even worse than what is now. Back then, so I thought, uh, Bangladesh. And so I thought, oh, Bangladesh, India, right? Same thing. But uh, then after the call, I checked in the map, and Bangladesh actually is next to India, right? To the east. So Bangladesh was part of Pakistan, was East Pakistan. So it's Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, so East Pakistan. And in the 70s, 1771 was the independent war. Uh, India helped uh, Bangladesh to become Bangladesh, and so it's a, it's a new country. So Bangladesh has the size of the state of Iowa. It has 170 million people. Uh, so it's the seventh most popular country in the world. 90% is Muslim, 8% Hindu, 2% Buddhist and Christians, and 40% of the people is illiterate. So if you can imagine a poor country, a small country, with so many people, um, with so much uh, illiteracy, uh, there is a lot of poverty. There is a lot of ground for abuse, right? So this is traffic. This is an old, the old Dhaka, as they call it, the old part of Dhaka, and they have these rickshaws. Uh, so you have the rickshaw with the guys pedaling, and then you have the, what we call baby taxi. That's with like a motorcycle. You go inside, and you see how many people there. And there is a, a, a big disparity. So here we have a nice uh, buildings. Uh, so there is uh, actually one of the four or five stars hotels. There are two or three of those. Right, uh, so it's the pool, and then there is a wall, and behind the wall there is a slam, what they call the slam. And so there is a, a big uh, contrast between the rich and the poor. So that was Dr. Karman when he visited, probably in the 1998, uh, eight, uh, 2000 and, no, 1999, I believe it was. So that was uh, the dental clinic. Uh, I was, there was an Australian dentist and then when he left, I became the director of the clinic there. I spent from 94 to 98. I graduated in Argentina dentistry in 93. In 94, I went there. I was a, a young, in, inexperienced guy. So we used to go to the countryside to do extractions, and as you guys have done in many mission trips, I know. And so this was in 98 when I was leaving. This was the staff. And then I will talk a little bit about Dr. Moscala. He came to replace me, and he's from the Czech Republic, and he spent there 17 years. So Dr. Moscala, uh, maybe some of you have heard his testimony. He opened 10 slum schools and actually one uh, street children's school. Uh, so he was uh, in charge of the, the dental office, and he has a big heart for mission, and so he opened these schools. Uh, he called them the light school. So the light schools, this is uh, uh, one of the schools uh, those days. So we rented the house, or he will rent the house, and the kids will stay in the floor, sit in the floor, and they will have um, the classes there. So since, uh, you know, I was a friend with, I was friend with Dr. Uh, Moscala, and we raised funds here to send to support his different ministries. And, um, um, so in 2013, you know, we knew that uh, we were um, in disadvantage uh, with other organizations because we were not able to give tax deductible receipts, which is important here as we donate. So we opened uh, Bangla Help. This is our website, banglahelp.org. And so we started to raise funds to, um, to send there. So let me tell you here a little bit of the testimony, then we'll go a little more to the work in Bangladesh and how is that uh, God led me to, to share the finances in Bangladesh. So uh, in 2011, sometime there, I'd, uh, I went through a divorce, and uh, I said, well, I need to do something useful in my life, no, not be sad. So I trained with Dr. Nedley to give the depression recovery seminars, and I was invited to go to, you guys know what it is? Is that Minnesota? Yeah? Okay, so I went to Minnesota to give a 
the seminar at the uh, Spanish church. So uh, when I arrived, the pastor uh, uh, took me to his house and uh, we introduced it itself. And so I was with Karen de la Cruz, uh, he, uh, Carlos knows her, and uh, she was the one that invited me to go there. And so we sat with the, with the pastor in the, in the sofa and one of the first things he says is, uh, Gerardo, what do you know about offering? That's how the conversation started. So I said, well, the tithe belongs to God, and the offerings is what we choose to give God as gratefulness for what he gives us, right? That's important message. And he said, well, let me show you something. So he went to Patrick's and Prophets, chapter 15, and then we read this, several of these quotes. The system of tithe and offerings was intended to impress the minds of men with the great truth that God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him men's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. As an acknowledgement that all things come from him, came from him, the Lord directed that a portion of his bounty should be returned to him in gifts and offerings to sustain his worship. So far, so good. That's, I kind of knew that. Then the contributions required of the Hebrews for religious and charitable purposes amounted to fully one-fourth of their income. So heavy a tax upon the resources of the people might be expected to reduce them to poverty. But on the contrary, the faithful observance of this regulation was one of the conditions of their prosperity. On condition of their obedience, God made them this promise. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome time, land, says the Lord of hosts. So another quote. In the days of Israel, the tithe and free will's offerings were needed to maintain the ordinances of divine service. Should the people of God give less in this age? The principle laid down by Christ is that our offerings to God should be in proportion to the light and privileges enjoyed. And to whosoever much is given, of him shall be much required. Said the Lord to his disciples as he sent them forth, freely you have received, freely give. As our blessings and privileges are increased, above all, as we have before us the unparalleled sacrifice of the glorious Son of God, should not our gratitude find expression in more abundant gifts to extend to others the message of salvation? The work of the gospel, as it widens, requires greater provision to sustain it than was called for anciently. And this makes the law of tithe and offerings of even more urgent necessity now than under the Hebrew economy. If his people were liberally to sustain his cause by the voluntary gift, instead of resorting to unchristian and unhallowed methods to fill the treasury, God will be honored, and many more souls should be won for Christ, or will be won for Christ. So he pointed to this part. He says, look, it says here the contributions required of the Hebrews. It didn't, it didn't say the contribution that God was expecting or it would be nice for them. It was they were required. It was a, a, a fully one-fourth of their income, so 25% between tithe and offerings. And then he said, um, I don't give to God what is the minimum required, so I give 30%. Between tithe and offerings, my wife gives 50%. So he said, no, 25% is, uh, is the required, so that's the minimum. And to God, you don't go, you know, the, the very least. You have to, so I say, no, he said, I give 30%, my wife gives 50%. So I was sitting there, and uh, at that time, I was giving, when I opened the practice, uh, we decided to, to give uh, tithe and 10% offering. And so he said, no, you don't have to try. You, you know, you, you think about it. I said, well, you know, um, to be honest, this was my thought. I always hear people talk about their uh, experiences in giving offerings, how God has blessed them. And I say, I don't want to tell other people's story. So I will, I will try this just so I can tell my story, which sounds selfish, but uh, I wanted to, you know, when, see, when you see somebody converted or, some, you know, like uh, Calvin was saying today, giving Bible studies and getting baptism and stuff, well, you know, it's nice to hear him, but I, I hope to have that experience myself. And so I said, okay, let me move to, to 20% and, and see what happens. So God was, uh, blessed me in, in, in different ways. Uh, I bought a CT scan for the office. I had two companies that didn't know me and, and kind of fighting to sell it and gave me a good price. 
Anyway, so that was four years later. Uh, God bless me. Uh, despite living in Bangladesh, despite the divorce, despite the, uh, that I was the new guy in town, uh, actually, like, last year or la year before, I checked my schedule, like, a few years ago. Just, I don't know why I did it. And I went, like, uh, six, seven years ago to look the schedule. And I saw one patient here, one patient there. And I literally had, like, a panic attack. Like, I started shaking. It's like, how did I do it? How did I send the money to, for the, how, how did I do it? So, like, I was overwhelmed. It's like, how, how did I do it? God was so, so nice, so, so kind to me that he provided, even though, you know, I opened my office 2008, and, the, you know, the 2000, uh, December, and I opened in August, and December was a big crash, so the first two years were very tough for us and so forth. So anyway, 2017, I'm uh, having a, a, a trip, vacation trip with my kids. We are in Costa Rica. Uh, we go rafting, and I start having severe pain in my left arm. So I called somebody to give me a massage. I thought it was the muscle. Anyway, ended up that at, uh, I had the disc was extruded between the 6th and 7th vertebra, 11 millimeters. So it was pushing the nerve. Uh, I was miserable for uh, probably, I, I was literally thinking I was going to go crazy because I couldn't sleep. And so I had to work. I will drive like this because this is the only position that the nerve doesn't hurt. So I will, one, night, uh, one day I was uh, kneeling down praying, and I realized I didn't have pain. So I will go to sleep kneeling down. And so I will wake up with my arms numb, but at least I could sleep. Otherwise, I couldn't sleep flat. So anyway, it was miserable. Uh, and so that's like in August, I, I realized that I need to have the surgery. And then uh, I'm the president of uh, Bangla Help, and uh, so I'm the one that makes the transfer. And we had to send the money, and there was not enough money to send. And so I heard this voice that uh, says, if you give 30% for offerings, there will be enough money for Bangladesh. So that will be tithe plus 30%. And so I said, well, Lord, I'm not sure if this is you, because uh, I'm going through a very difficult time. Physically and emotionally, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. So I said, okay, I'll give you 30% from now till December. If I'm able to pay the bills, I'll keep giving 30%. If I can't pay the bills, daddy was not you who gave me this idea. So I guess you can guess that uh, we serve a faithful God. And even though I had to close the office for two weeks, uh, I paid the bills. Uh, so I, uh, I continue giving the tithe and the 30%. So now comes the, the, the bad and the ugly. So last year, as uh, most of you, I was affected also with the COVID and seeing only emergency patients, maybe one patient a day and so. And so it was good that we got the PPP. Probably some of you also got the uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program. It was a good amount uh, that I got. So in, uh, in April, I received the money from the government. But I don't think I need to pay tax offering from this money. Somehow, in my selfish mind, my carnal mind, I figured it out that it didn't apply. So, but God is patient, and he waits. So this year, in January, uh, we got again uh, another check. And so the question came to my mind, should I pay tithes and offerings from this money? So the, the Solomon said, in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. So I called my friend Manuel. It's a very nice guy, and uh, the way I have the this, uh, this, the offering and the tithe, uh, sometimes if I have doubt, I call him uh, just to somebody to strengthen the, the thought. And so he said, yes, you should pay tithe and offering from this money. So I said, okay, no problem, I'll pay. And then the voice came, Gerardo, remember last year? <laughs> you know, God never forgets. He forgets our sins only. <laughs> so I said, what? <laughs> so... I take my donation last year, and no, I had not paid the tithe and offerings on the first PPP loan. So I paid for both, and uh, this, the money gave me was uh, allowed me to do the 20% and the, 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 the 60%. And um, so I, I had a slide, I removed it, I'm not sure why, but uh, there are three, um, it is, uh, you know, it, when, you're, when, when we read uh, Helen White about this, and there is a purpose, you know, God doesn't need our money. And sometimes, you know, it's very easy to feel, oh, you know, I give this much, God, why? I mean, don't think that uh, I, I have no question of fight God, with God, even this week. Um, uh, the bank account was very low, as low as in a long time. And I had problems um, 
tell you more later, maybe when coming back from Bangladesh, the pro project we are, do we are doing now, uh, in June, since I came back in June from Bangladesh, it has been one problem after another, like uh, attorney fees, firing people. I mean, it, it has been painful. And so uh, I was thinking, this was Tuesday, and I was thinking, you know, I had this presentation ready, and I said, uh, what if it, this doesn't really work? What if, I, what if I go in red? And I was praying like Moses, say, Lord, Lord, uh, I don't need the money to be happy, but don't let the Egyptians say that you took me to this point and you didn't care. So, so the pain is when we distrust God. So on Tuesday, I called this pastor, the first day that explained to me, and I explained, look, pastor, this is what is happening. And he said, well, God will, uh, Satan will cause you to, to tremble and not to be faithful. And then he read, uh, we start, he got again, and he explained to me this, you know, this is what it says. And uh, he said, well, you know, uh, the 25 is between both, but you, you promise that to God. And then he read the verse, um, I think it's, uh, I forgot what it is. Anyway, you know, when uh, Nehemiah, you know, they start, the, the people start building their houses, but not the temple. And so God, uh, you know, sent, you know, is not blessing them. And so the people say, no, we are going to build the temple. And so he's reading, I, I, I was standing outside of the office in the back, just to get some time, I was talking with him. And I was, as he keeps talking, and then he said, you know, uh, the Bible says that God says, since you have decided today that you're going to build the temple, I will start blessing you today. So I'm not going to wait to see. That's because you have this in your heart. So the pastor keeps talking, and I, I'm not listening. I'm just being respectful, just holding here. And I'm praying. I say, Lord, I know this is, I don't know why I call him if I knew. My problem is not what it says. My problem is I need to decide to trust you. And I say, you know, Lord, I will give it. And so the, the afternoon was very peaceful. And I, I have had peace since then. And uh, so... Um, I tell this testimony because uh, the first is no, God doesn't need our, our money. And I will show you some, you know, experiences in Bangladesh. What he needs is our heart. And that's the most difficult. That's the most difficult. To trust him. You know, Helen White says, how we can, you know, how will you feel as a parent if your child is trusted? You know, those of us that are parents. How, you know, if, if my son will say, you know, I don't trust you, you know, daddy. How pain, I mean, there's nothing more painful than that. So anyway, uh, another quote from Kelly White says, money has great value because it can do great good. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. It is a defense for the oppressed and a means of help to the sick. But money is of no more value than sand, only as it is put to use in providing for. So there are three things we should use money for. The necessities of life, in blessing others, and advancing the cause of Christ. But then it came to my mind, Proverbs 23, 26, my son, give me your heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. This is, this is the most difficult, at, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving our hearts to, to God. You know, money is easy to, to do, to give. Uh, but giving our hearts to trust him is the most difficult part. Anyway, I just wanted to test this, share a testimony. And, um, and one of the things, probably the, the two most important slides are, are at the end, and that's not in, in regards to me. Um, but as I'm thinking, uh, as I was thinking how to present to you, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir. I know you guys go to missionary, uh, you know, trips, and uh, you guys give money. But I think um, um, either money, time, uh, it's nearby and far away. I think that we are expecting to give more uh, while it is there. Uh, we really need to live uh, in a simple, you know, as Kelly White said, the necessities of life. What is the necessity I have? What is really a necessity, and what is a a, a want. What is the difference? And uh, anyway, let, let's go to, let me bring you back to Bangladesh. This is more, more interesting fun. So we have Bangla Help. We have uh, five slum schools, which are churches. We have churches that there. We have 31 teachers. This year we have 907 students, 832 children, and 75 adults. We started, the problem was the, teach, the parents, because they are illiterate, they couldn't help the kids with, um, with homework. So they requested that uh, we give them so we started a two years program for, uh, for adults. We have 605 Muslims, 266 Hindus, the rest are Christians. 
we have had 11 students baptized and three parents baptized, and three of these are from the Muslim background. So next year, we're expecting to have 980 students. So this was one of the schools. So when uh, Dr. Moscala retired uh, a few b years back, so we got uh, four of the schools, and then we opened one more. And uh, other slums, they kept asking us to open s schools because we provide food. So at, up to that point, we had up to third grade. And so we said, okay, we can, if we keep expanding, we have to keep up to third grade. So we said, okay, let's stop at five schools, and we'll start going every year, we'll increase one grade. So this year we had seventh grade. Next year, eighth grade, that's the minimum goal, because in Bangladesh, if you have the eighth grade, then you can go for skill training by the government to become a truck driver or whatever. So next year, by God's grace, we can uh, graduate that class, and hopefully, as God provides, we'll keep going all the way till 12th grade, but at least to eighth, eighth grade. That will be very successful for us and, and, and helpful for the kids. So with the you know, help of uh, many donors, uh, we were able to buy, it, uh, these are now our, uh, uh, our schools. You know, we have a bench and uh, places for the kids to sit. So Dr. Moscala, when they asked them, what fruit do you guys like? And they said, no, no we don't need fruit, we are poor. <laughs> So he knew that uh, bananas are good. Seems to be bananas seem to be a very healthy fruit. So he had the, the banana ministry. So they will give him one banana a day. Then we decided a few years ago, we will give uh, rice dal, which is lentils, some vegetables, and uh, one egg twice a week. So we started two days a week, three days a week, and now we give uh, five days a week. And for some kids, these are, this is the only meal they get. So they get one piece of bread, they get the banana, and then they get the, uh, the, the meal, as that's in classroom, so they just uh, have there. So as you can imagine, COVID also hit very hard in this country. So last year, in, we did two feeding, uh, one in June, uh, and I think we did, we did one this year. And so this is uh, Martin, he's the manager for, for our school. This is the entrance of one of the schools. And so we sent uh, relief distribution. We gave uh, two, uh, two weeks supplies of rice, uh, dal, salt, and oil. Uh, that, that's very funny, you know, not funny, it's very cute when you see the list of, you know, here, I don't know, we will buy, you know, different stuff. There is, is rice, dal, uh, you know, salt, and oil. You know, when you see the list, it's very cute. When you see, I don't know, it, to me, it's, it's, it's cute. Um, so these are the students. So we gave first for 680, Families, then we gave to 900 families. And uh, so you see there the distribution. And the parents were very, very grateful for that. So the, so the church, so we are an independent ministry here, a nonprofit organization. So we send the money through the church, the Bangladesh Mission. They have a department, BCSS, Bangladesh Children's Sponsorship Scholars uh, Services. So they raise funds for the orphanages and all of that. So we send the money through them, they give the money to Martin, our manager, and he gives the receipts to BCSS. So the church, BCSS, they have 125 village schools. So this is in the countryside. Uh, you can see one of the schools, very poor, you can, as you can imagine. And so we are sponsoring four schools also there. This is one of the schools, this teacher is doing a great job. Um, you see he's planting, I'm not sure what is the vegetable there, but he's giving away to, uh, to the villagers. And then this is other feeding in other of the schools. Beautiful. I mean, the countryside in Bangladesh is so beautiful, so green, uh, if you ever have the chance to go there. So this is a, a adult class. These three ladies, they went early to class to finish their homework. And this year, I'll show you in a moment, uh, we started a project and we are working with AWR. And uh, this year we brought uh, the radios, and so we distributed it to them. Um, they are, m most of them, they are Muslim or Hindus. So this lady, so, you know, there are many things that we take for granted, like reading and writing, or going to school, which for us becomes kind of a, you know, we don't like going to school, especially when you're a child. So these women, they realize when they learn, not, not sure what is causing the problem, but anyway, we'll keep going. Um, um, when they learn to, to read and write and see numbers, they realize that when they went to the market, one of them went to pay the bill, you know, the electricity bill, okay, 100 taka. And she says, no, it says 80 here. And then she realized all her life she has been cheated because she didn't know how to read. 
So they say, you know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we take things for, for granted. That to read, so you can imagine that all your life, 10 tacos here, 20 tacos there, and you're poor. It's not like, you know, you're not American. And so this lady, uh, you know, she opened her own tea shop. And, uh, uh, you know, other ladies uh, uh, open other, other stuff. So they are very grateful that they're able to read and write. And so we have a church school. In each of our schools, we have a church. We have had baptisms, as we said. And our schools, although they are poor, our teachers, we have been blessed with very good uh, teachers, very, very good, very consecrated. You know, they had parents' meetings. It's not like because we are poor, we do whatever. No. They had parents' meetings, and they talk, you know, they give classes to the kids, to the parents about parenting and, and health and so forth. We had also the Menton Church supported uh, a sewing machine project. So we did first six months training for six women, then to 24 women, uh, six in each of the four schools that we had then. And so we gave them the, uh, the sewing machine. And the, uh, so this is their home. This is, the, is, this, is, this is how the house is there. So the house is, is one room, one bed. Everybody sleeps in the same bed. And that's where they work. And so they are very happy to, to, you know, to be able to support the, the family financially. So in, uh, five, six years ago, I had, uh, so we, had, we wanted to start uh, rescuing girls from prostitution. And we started the House of Hope. These were three girls uh, with very sad stories. Um, but the project, it was an expensive project. And we pray, we pray, we work, and after six months, we had to close. Uh, this girl, sorry, the, the one in, in yellow, she ran away. And uh, the other ones uh, wanted to leave. So it was very difficult. You know, I was saying, God, why? I mean, we're doing something good. Why is it not working? And something that we learned is that uh, it came to my mind what uh, David, God told David, you know, you're not going to build the temple. It will be somebody else. And, we have and so this year in June, we were able to bring Pastor uh, Eugene Pruitt. Uh, I'm sure you guys know, know him. Um, he came to train our teachers, uh, yes, uh, train our teachers how to reach the Muslims. And so this is we meet at uh, one of the, se the seminaries there in Bangladesh. These are teachers. And uh, that's Pastor Pruitt with his wife. And so th they gave the uh, two books, Education and um, the Ministry of Healing in Bangla. They, he gave them to our teachers. And then we started the project we called the Destitute Women Development. And God guided, it's a long story, so I, I won't go into that. But it was, let me tell you quickly. So you know Kyle from AWR? Kyle, what is the last name? Allen. Okay, so he was a pastor in Menton, so I knew him. So we have a friend in common. And so this friend organized a dinner. So we go, it's a Monday, I go after work, so we are eating. And then after we sit in the living room to, to, to talk, it was like 9 o'clock. And um, I'm, I'm not a very social guy, and I was tired, so I wanted to go home. But I said, well, I need to be, you know, I, I had to fake it till you make it. So I stay there, you know, they were talking. And so Greg, the guy who organized, tells Kyle, oh, you know, we used to have a, pro a project to rescue girls from prostitution. And so the, the conversation started there, and so... Kyle calls Tim Saxton, uh, who works for uh, White Horse Media, now he's in AWR. Uh, we should give uh, Bangla Help some radios. So the conversation started there, and so we organized the project to start to rescue women from prostitution. Uh, so this was God guided everything. It was no, I mean, I was falling asleep, and then I woke up when they started uh, talking. <laughs> because this is a project that always been interested. So uh, we met these four, there are five, but this is, uh, she's the daughter of this lady. These ladies, they are all Christians. Because of COVID and poverty, they, they, they started the, the sex work. These ladies, she threw away all her Bibles three weeks before we went there. Because she was saying, what is God? Why I don't have, an, you know, what is God? Uh, this lady, she tried to commit suicide three times. The last time, it was two weeks before we got there. So they were very happy when we tried to, you know, have the process to, to, to rescue them. So we, there were some issues with her. Uh, and with the daughter, daughter is pregnant, so we had now helping these three ladies. So that's Tim giving them uh, in the training session the, uh, the Adventist World Radios. And so this is, uh, they went to the, uh, they are staying for six months in an in apartment that we are renting. Actually, AWR is renting. And so they're getting training to get a vocational training uh, that should end in December. Then we went to Daulatia. Daulatia is a small town. Uh, four or five hours from Dhaka, the capital. And in Daulatia, it's the biggest brothel in the world. It's uh, 1,300 sex workers. They live in the same place. And uh, so we got to meet 
some of them, there is an organization, KKS, I'll show you a picture in a moment. So they brought these ladies to, to talk with us. So we wanted to learn how we can help them. And so uh, this is Martin, this is a volunteer went there, Tim Saxon, myself, and Luther. Uh, you'll hear about Luther. Luther, when we had the previous project, we worked with him, we tried to. Uh, we got into differences, uh, we fought, we didn't talk to each other, we didn't email to each other, and then we made peace. And so every night I tried to send my friends, I sent my friends uh, a quote from Helen, Helen White, and one day I sent it to him. And uh, so I keep sending, so our friendship starts to grow back again. And it has been such a blessing because he has been so instrumental in what I will show you in a moment. Um, this man, so this man is a freedom fighter. Remember the independence war? He was one of the soldiers, Bengali soldiers. So he's very respected. He's a, a politician. He's in charge of the big area there. He knows the, the, primary, uh, the, the prime minister. The prim so the, the liberator of Bangladesh, he went to school to an Adventist school when he was a child. And so the, the daughter of the, this guy is the prime minister now. And so he knows the prime minister. Anyway, this man, Muslim guy, very nice, very nice organization, KKS. They have a safe home. So they take the daughters of the sex workers from the brothel, they bring them here so they are safe and they don't go into prostitution. Because the problem is men, every time they want younger girls, which are sold into the, the, into the brothel. Uh, so I tell you more about, about him. Very nice, I mean, these people are so nice. It's the first time we meet. And they see that we try to help. And so he's one of us, it wasn't me, it was other person goes, and they open the books, their accounting books. You imagine that a Muslim guy comes to Loma Linda and Dr. Hart says, hey, here are the accounting, no, here are the books, you, you, you check it. I mean, never. This guy, they opened the books, I mean, it, it, and everything was clean, it, it, was, it was wonderful. Anyway, so we met, we brought, when we had the first meeting, this girl there called Pona. She was the, the one talking the most. She was quite feisty. Talking, 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 talking. No, everybody, so, Kolpona, she was sold into the brothel when she was seven years old. And she said, everybody comes, takes picture with us, and make documentaries, but then they forget about us. And so that night, we spent in a hotel nearby, and we said, okay, whatever we do, we cannot do the same. So we need to do something. Whatever it is, we, so we decided, uh, uh, Adventist World Radio, LWR, they will sponsor the three women they saw before uh, in Dhaka, and Bangla Help and the other missionary, we will sponsor 10 girls in the safe home. So the daughters, because they were running out of money, so this, the, the sex workers had to pay. I said, we don't have the money, three, uh, maybe $40 monthly. We don't have the money to pay for, for our daughters. Anyway, so this is safe home. We got to visit there. These are the girls, uh, some of the girls that were there at that point. So now we are sponsoring uh, it costs us $100 per child plus, so Bangla Help, 100% of the donation goes to the kids. We, the, 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 the board of directors, we pay for the, for the uh, administrative cost, which is 5%. So each girl costs $105 total for a month. So Kolpona, I, I got her, uh, we got into WhatsApp, and so, you know, I don't speak Bangla, but we send messages through my friend Luther, he translates, and um, so one day, you know, she said, uh, because of COVID, we are having less clients, so we don't have food. This was June this year. So uh, we talked with AWR, and then we organized uh, the Bangla Help, Adventist World Radio, and KKS Food Relief. So this, this is very cute. Rice, cooking oil, dal, sugar, salt, potato, onion, power milk, soap bathing, and soap laundry. And uh, so we gave to 60 of the sex workers. And then the, the COVID continues, so we gave for 200 people, 100 villagers and 100 women there. And, and then we did again for 100 women more in, in, the, in the brothel. Because we, we understood these women, and rightly so, they don't trust anybody. When we went five years ago, we talked with other group of sex workers, and we were there, and they say, no, we don't trust you. I mean, they tell you right in the face. Because so many people have failed them, the government, everybody abused of them, they don't trust anybody. So this is the feeding when they distributed, again, two weeks of food. So how God is working. So this, this, the time when we give to the villagers, our friend Luther, he goes there, and they bring him to Nodi. So Nodi is the daughter of a sex worker, 
Another sex worker, when she retires, starts taking care of the girls uh, there. One of them is Nodi. She has a little bit paralyzed the right side. She's given into marriage. So these women, these ex-sex workers, take care of the kids and kind of adopt Nodi. So Nodi becomes pregnant. Her husband beats her up, leaves her, and for 10 days she couldn't sleep. And that's when Luther goes there. And so he texts, and we say, well, you know, we'll pay for the makeup bill. So Nodi went there. Now she's doing fine. She has twins. She will be delivering in December. And now she has told, you know, Luther goes and visits, and he said, you know, you guys are my only hope. Uh, nobody, you know, my man doesn't have money. Nobody here will help me. You're so we see that God is, is giving us, you know, he's putting in, in our hands people to help. And Pastor Pruitt, we are talking with him because he's going to live there in Bangladesh. He may kind of adopt Nodi and take care of her. So going back to Kalpona, just to show you that sometimes we can judge people on their appearances. So we were paying for her daughter for, to be at the safe home. And then one day she calls Luther and says, we are now having more clients. You don't have to keep paying for my daughter at the safe home. That's amazing. Because we never say, hey, you know, you guys have to pay us back. Let us know when you have more clients. Out of the blue, she, you know, she's so honest that she says, no, I have enough clients. It's not like, you know, I'm selling things. No, I'm selling my body. I had to go through the trauma, but I'm a responsible mother. I, I think this is amazing. The character of, of this, no? I mean, probably you women will you say, no, let them pay. I mean, these foreigners, you know, let them pay. and I'll keep quiet. You know, I sleep with less men. And you see what I'm saying? Then one day she called Luther and said, I need 2,000 taka, which is, uh, I don't know, a few, a few dollars, urgently because the landlord is putting a lot of pressure on me, but I will pay you back. Anyway, so uh, this group, or KKS, they have a training center for garments. As you know, Bangladesh exports a lot of clothes. So we are trying to see if we can rehabilitate the center, train the women to, so they can go work in garments. So going back to this man, he is, they started the safe home 1997. But they had to actually, as you can imagine, in this brothel, there is a lot of, you know, there's mafia, there is, there is drugs, there is a lot of things going on. So they had to actually sometimes physically fight because people didn't want them there. So they have done all the dirty work. But this is, you know, when I was thinking of him, it's a very nice man. You know, Luther tells me he's a very nice, very, very nice man. And two, two, two verses came to my mind. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. And I was listening uh, today in one of the presentations. I don't know if it was you, Calvin, or, or uh, the other doctor. There is a quote in Helen that says that uh, God will use people, non-Adventists also, to, uh, to bring blessings for people. And uh, in 1997, God, according to this verse, was ranging throughout the earth. And the only people that he could find to take care of the ladies in the brothel were Muslim people. He went to the Adventist people, the Baptist people, he went to, these people are not ready, so let's use the Muslim. I mean, this is very humbling when we feel that we have the truth. And uh, when we discuss this year there uh, with the people in, in, the, in the, the church, the administrators, uh, they say, well, you know, you have been with us so long, you have supported us, so we give you six months to send the money for this project, but don't bring these girls to the church. But God has, is, is working also in the Adventist people. And um, so this is Pastor Das. This is the pastor that we send the money through. He's the president of the director of BCSS. And uh, they went to visit the place. And this man, the freedom fighter, this is what he said. You guys can do here any project you like. You have our full support. Now, this is a Muslim guy working for a Muslim government talking to Christian. I mean, he's no fool. He knows what Christians are doing there. And pastor that say, I've worked for the church for more than 20 years. We have never had people from the government say this stuff. I mean, the church has paid money in order to get permits, to be honest. So uh, this is the first time. They have told us several times, whatever, whatever you guys do, what you guys should do, do it. We get you the permit. We give you the lands. He has, okay, I'll tell you more, a little more in the morning. So... We said for, this is uh, Kolpona, and this is Maya, other girl that, from the brothel. 
and this is all from, from KKS, the organization, and that's Luther. So we brought them to DACA to visit, they went to the mission, and to my surprise, the, the president, I'll show you some pictures there. This is the mission, uh, uh, the mission cap ground. So this is the president of the Adventist church, that's the, the treasurer, and they made the big uh, welcoming, and so we took them to one of our slum schools, they took, we took them to a seminary of the church, uh, they have a nursing school, and Colpona, that's Colpona, she was saying to Luther, Luther, our daughters need to come to study nursing here. And one of the, one of the people from KKS, after they went to school, he said, how much is, how much is to send my kid? I want my, my kids to come here. So the Muslims are trying to send the, the, their kids to the Adventist school. So this is uh, giving some gifts there, some literacy. So other project that Luther suggested is a transgender ministry. As, as a, over there, they are very rejected. So in June, we met with this guy, Shubro. And uh, so this, is, this was in a restaurant. Uh, he was telling us, you know, there are like 75 of them living together. And, uh, you know, listen to the stories. It's very sad, the life that they have. And so Luther has kept in, chair, in, in touch with, uh, this is Jewel. And so now uh, AWR put us in touch with Jesus for Asia. I know you have other. And so one of them, Sharon, is very interested in this ministry. So we are trying to, to reach them as well. And this is something that we have seen. If say, Satan sees that he's in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the ut utmost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks for Jesus, to Jesus for strength, Satan fears that he will lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement, reinforcement of his angels to hedge in, the, hedge in the poor soul, sorry for my English, and form a world of darkness around him. But if the one in danger perseveres and in his helplessness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith and send a reinforcement of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. And since we have gone in June there, as I was telling you, and Luther was telling me the same, we, we see God opening doors and we see Satan trying to discourage us. I mean, it has been, Luther also said, you know, it has been one problem after the other. So Satan is not happy. It's not like, oh, okay, guys, you enter in the biggest problem in the world, okay, I might as well go somewhere else. Satan, you know, is, is, uh, he's evil. He's evil. And, uh, and that's why uh, we are praying now every day we meet with people from Jesus for Asia and Luther, and every morning we pray for the Holy Spirit. Every morning we pray. Uh, 20 minutes, that's before I go to lunch, because of the time difference, that's uh, the time that we can. Because this is something, it's not our money, it's not our resources, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the only way. I mean, all this time and effort that we are putting, and it's a lot, it's a lot of talking and a lot of that, it's for three girls. There are 1,300. It is beyond, I mean, we can all give, sell our houses, and I mean, it's, not, it's never enough for us. It's, it's not possible for us. So the, the freedom fighter calls Luther and says, there is a sweepers colony. So when the British, British built the, the railways in the 1800s, or 1900s, they brought the untouchables from India. So the sweepers, they're the ones that clean. So the, the Mennonites opened a school 20 years ago and now nobody runs the school. There are 250 families of Hindu background, the untouchables. So the Freedom Fire offered us to run the school. This is the school, needs some repair, and that's Luther, the Freedom Fighter, and these are the leaders of the community. So we are uh, also seeing if we can adopt this school and you know, if we can run it. I mean, we have 250 families that they are, you know, we can do whatever we want, and they have no money, so nobody cares for them. We, can, we had the opportunity to, to work there. So this is one of the most important slides today. Luther. Uh, we had differences in the past, I told you. His family, because of the, the health of his daughter, lives in Thailand. He volunteers in our project. When I call him in May, I say, no, there is no money here. He said, that's fine. This is my passion. So I, this week, I called him and said, Luther, what do you... Do you take vacations? What, what do you do for fun? I mean, because this guy is always visiting one project, the other. I mean, it's just, it's a machine. Three hours traffic, three hours back home. I mean, this is another level of commitment. And he says, I'm son of a poor man. I don't have money for vacations. For fun, I watch apologetic discussions between Christians and Muslims. And I felt miserable. You know, because I'm always planning, I know you guys you know, when is the next, Vacation, when is the next conference? When is the next, I don't know, 
going to the beach. So that's why I say, you know, we, I, I know that we all give uh, of time and money and, and, and prayer, and, you know, and tr I mean, you guys could tell your testimony. But when you hear these stories, or the story of Kolpona, it's like we have not, I mean, sometimes, you know, many times when I complain, which, you know, I, I do to God sometimes, you know, why this or that, I think of Kolpona, I say, I have nothing to complain. What are you complaining about? I mean, we have, right, so our, our priorities have to change in the West. And then he says, Peter had problems, Paul had problems, talking to the apostles. After working many years, they did not retire and build a nice home to live in. All right. Okay, Luther, stop preaching. You know, it's like, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> it's like, don't make me feel miserable, man. It's like, it, it is right or not? The apostles, you know, right? One is crucified, the other one is decapitated and whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm planning to see how soon I can get, you know. I don't know. That's why I'm saying, you know. We need to give our hearts to God. It, it is just it's another level of commitment. So anyway, the missionaries also need help. And I, God has uh, given me the opportunity. This is Dr. Artavia. He's the dentist there from Costa Rica. And then one day he, came, he comes once a year uh, or every two years to Loma Linda. And so one day I asked him, you know, do you have loop? No. So I bought him the loop. And what I'm sharing this, again, you know, I, I, it's not comfortable, but I share it because something that came to my mind as I was, uh, you know, uh, thinking of the presentation is sometimes we go to, to a mission field and we, we meet the, the, the missionaries. But my case has been I forget about the missionaries. And I was a missionary there. And you feel quite lonely there. And I think we have resources. I say, how is it possible that, uh, you know, we, we, we are so proud. The, the Adventist clinic there was the best some time ago. Now it's no more. The other people that implant, they do ortho and whatever. And we, we think that because we have the name, you know, that, okay, we were once the best, we might be the best. No, no, you are no longer the best. You don't even have loop. And so la the last year, he said, uh, we were talking on the phone, and he said, no, we don't have money to pay the staff salaries because of the COVID. So I talked with Dr. Nick, uh, and it was $2,000. So I said, well, if you give me a tax deductible receipt, you know, sadly, we, we give sometimes when we get the receipt. Uh, so we pay for one month, said Dr. Nick said, he asked other alumni, and they pay. So... What I'm presenting is that we have the opportunity and we should be also helping the missionaries out there. Because here we have endodontists, uh, prostodontists, periodontists, uh, pedodontists. Over there, you are everything. I mean, you have to learn to do everything, and sometimes you are not trained to do everything. When I went from Argentina, I, I knew how to do wisdom tooth, but I had to learn things. So I think it's a responsibility for us, not only the poor people, but also our own soldiers, that they are, you know, without loops. I mean. I'm sure all of you work with loops. Hygienists use work loops here, right? Anyway, so in 2020, we had the coronavirus, we had the, um, the election, we had uh, Black Lives Matter and all this and social unrest in Portland and, and so. So as, as you listen in YouTube or ministries, I don't know what you follow, sometimes I look at things. So everybody, I felt this is my, you know, no, me, you know l let me share what, what was in my heart. I was thinking, you know, I had to buy, I, I've seen many people who had to go to the countryside, and, you know, Helen White says that, and nothing wrong with that. So I was thinking, well, I don't have enough money for the land, so at least buy a, a motorhome uh, to, to, you know, at least I can, you know, at night leave Loma Linda and go somewhere. And then I listened to, to a, a, a sermon by Pastor Ron Cluset. This is probably the most important slide in the, in the talk today. And it's to encourage you, if you haven't, look for... Pastor Ron Cluset, Ron Cluset in YouTube and buy his book or listen to his sermons. It's, just, uh, it's another level. Uh, maybe uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to bring him to Amen as the main speaker. Uh, his, uh, his topic is Holy Spirit. And so he was saying, you know, so I'm thinking this was like in October. We are traveling with Carlos and his wife to visit a friend. And we are discussing all of this. And I'm, you know, I'm letting out all I have in my you know, I had to buy an RV or whatever. And then in, from this division, he is in the uh, Northern Asia division. It's the largest population, 1.6 billion. It's the most secular population, only 4% Christian. A, a thorough naturalist and spiritualistic influence. And so he's telling all this data, all this data, all this data. And I'm thinking, and you are concerned about country living when there are billions of people they don't only care about Jesus, they don't know who he is, and they could care less about who he is. 
So the, again, Bangladesh, 170, I'm, I'm sure Bangladesh because that's what, you know, you guys could tell me about Jamaica or whatever you are supporting. 90% Muslim, 8% Hindu, 2% Christian, 40% population is illiterate. So we know Jesus is coming. But I have the feeling, this is my feeling, for what, you know, at least the social media that I see, some ministries, we are quite desperate to save our souls and have a, 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 nothing wrong, you know, because I, I'm not, I, I cannot go against what the prophet and what the Bible says. But there are millions of people. There are thousands of sex workers. There are thousands of transgender. There is millions, 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 millions. And we are, it's like Jesus is coming. It's, it will come to the U.S. and Europe because other people don't know. I mean, he's coming. What, what is happening? You see what I'm saying? So... Anyway, sorry if I'm going off, but the only way the Great Commission will be complete, completed is if we fully submit our lives to God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is what I like Pastor Ron Cluset and the story he tells. There is, there is all, you know, it's the only way. You go to Bangladesh, you think that passing glows in Bangladesh? 170 million, I mean, it's people, 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 that they don't want to know about Jesus. I mean, we help three, again, we help three sex workers. There are 1,300. And this is one, one brothel. Then you go to Thailand, 15,000 in the streets. It's impossible. So this is, you know, we really need to, to consecrate ourselves and we need to, the later rain. It's the only way. Otherwise, we stay here many years. God is already working in the hearts of people in places we would never thought of. Like a brother in Bangladesh, like Muslim people. They, they did the, after visiting the school, the freedom fighter says, Kind of angry. And so why your church didn't open a school in, in Rajvari? In, in the, you know, and so Luther said, well, you know, why well, we don't have land? Well, I give you the land. A Muslim giving to a Christian? Land. So Jesus will not only come to the U.S. or Europe. We need to reach out the world, including people we may think as hopeless. Because the, the, Matthew says that the, when the gospel is given to everybody, that includes transgender, sex workers, and whatever group of people we may not want to reach. He will not come until the word goes to everybody. So we better include everybody, whether we like them or not. Otherwise, we stay here for a long time. Also, the missionaries need our financial, emotional, and spiritual support. So adopt a clinic. If you go somewhere else, Jamaica, and there is a dentist, stay in touch with him, send him articles of endo, extraction, or whatever. You know, we here, we have too much. We have a lot, and they don't. As dentists practicing in the U.S., we have many opportunities and blessings to help people nearby and around the world. So for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So the question is if we are committed to him. So what is day? Hopefully God can uh, continue, and we are grateful that he continues to touch our hearts despite our sins. And uh, hopefully this conference will help us all to be a vessel. And uh, whatever here, nearby, but let's not forget those that are far away. So thank you. God bless.